1884, representatives of the uh, colonial powers of Europe gathered in Berlin at the invitation of Otto von Bismarck of Germany to partition Africa amongst themselves. The main cause of the scramble for Africa was that European nations needed large territories to increase their access to resources and people and open up markets for their goods. Africa was a fertile ground for them. Now, are we naive enough to think that that need has now gone away? Let's think again. Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe if you have not yet done so and please turn on your notification buttons so you know when we have new episodes. Also, please share our videos with all your contacts. Let's just look at a few of Africa's abundant resources, which continue to make the continent a target for resource-hungry countries. Africa holds 90% of the world's platinum supply. Platinum is, of course, way more valuable than gold. Platinum is highly prized because of its rarity and density. The electronics industry uses platinum for computer hard disks and uh, thermocouples. Platinum is also used to make optical fibers and LCDs, turbine blades, um, spark plugs, pacemakers, and dental fillings. Platinum compounds are important chemotherapy drugs used to treat cancers. Again, Africa holds 90% of the world's cobalt supply. Cobalt is critical for the production of lithium ion uh, batteries. In fact, 50% of the world's cobalt demand is for its use in rechargeable batteries. 75% of the world's supply of coltan, another valuable resource, is got from Africa. Coltan is used primarily for the production of tantalum uh, of tantalum capacitors used in many electronic devices coltan is important in the production of mobile phones and tantalum capacitors are used in almost every kind of electronic device manganese is another rare resource which is used for the preparation of vital medicines it is also essential in the making of steel, and Africa produces 75% of the world supply. The continent also holds half of the world's gold supply, not to talk of diamonds and other precious stones and metals like uranium. The list is endless. Without these precious natural resources from Africa, the largest companies in the world, such as Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, the whole bally lot of them will collapse. Yet, 9 out of 10 times, when Africa makes the news, it is when there are reports of disease, um, conflict, and famine. Unfortunately, our politicians, I hate to call them leaders, who are blinded by corruption, are content to continue to go cap in hand begging for aid. Who has ever heard of a country which developed by depending on aid? Unfortunately, very few of our activists, even well-meaning ones, have taken the time to link the state of things in Africa to the warped global economic system or the ongoing scramble for Africa. Because the scramble continues. Let me try and break some of the connections down. Now, the original scramble was done through brute force to extract 
and cut off um, raw materials, uh, physically colonize and exert geopolitical influence. Um, this was done. Um, the key players were, of course, uh, then European countries, while the others like the US, Canada, Australia, and so on were their silent partners. The current scramble is a little subtler, even though more countries have joined the race. So, in addition to the participants at the Berlin Conference, we now have countries like China, Japan, Israel, even other developing countries like India and so on, all scrambling for Africa's resources. What makes this ongoing scramble for Africa insidious is the fact that it is a hydra-headed attack. The various countries that are desperate for African resources use different approaches. Dicey investments, diplomacy, soft power, trade, dirty geopolitics, pitching African countries against one another, francophones versus anglophones versus lusophones and so, and so on. Now, if you are like me, you might be wondering, why on earth does the, does the continent of Africa remain so vulnerable? Well, um, quite apart from the fact that the slave trade and colonization did quite a number on the continent, please go and see our episodes on the real causes of poverty in Africa, if you haven't watched it. The majority of African countries have never ever had a chance to be truly independent. And as such, so-called sustainable development funds continue to be major ways to keep us entrapped. For instance, while the European Union has pledged more than $54 billion in sustainable investment for Africa, which gives EU countries access to the African market of about 1.3 billion people, the same EU has negotiated free trade ag agreements with at least 40 of the 54 African countries. Now, these are agreements that do not allow any form of balanced two-way trade. Again, this divide and rule mechanism is often used against us in the UN in spite of the fact that we have 54 votes. Africa has 54 votes in the United Nations General Assembly. Let me illustrate. In 2016, when Israel needed votes against Palestine in the UN, Benjamin Netanyahu started visiting African countries. His spiel at the time was that Israel and Africa had a common history of oppression. He then promised to provide those countries with drip irrigation to help increase crop production. Unfortunately, Senegal chose to co-sponsor a UN reg uh, regulation which condemned the construction of illegal Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Israel, of course, promptly cancelled the irrigation system it promised. As the popular saying goes, there is no free ride in Freetown. This is why we should remain wary of China's interests in Africa. Projections indicate that by 2050, Africa's population will double. By the year 2100, it is expected that one out of every three people on earth will be African. This means that by the end of the century, Sub-Saharan Africa which already has a predominantly youthful population, will be home to almost half of the young people in the world. Yet, our youths are the most underprepared to take on leadership roles in the world. Ch 
China, <laughs> a Johnny just come lately world power, seems to have the biggest interest in Africa. China funds about one in every five major infrastructural projects on the continent. However, it is dangerous for us to think that this is out of any kind of love for Africa. From around um, 2005, China has invested trillions in Africa. One of its major projects uh, there is the One Belt, One Road, which comprises thousands of kilometers of railways. The railroad is China's signature vision for reshaping its global engagements. It will, of course, further open up the continent for China to continue dumping its goods because over 30% of China's investment in Africa are in the mining sector. China extracts raw materials at, let's say, at a fraction of their costs, manufactures products uh, with those same raw materials, and then sells them back to Africa for huge profits. The very same thing that Africa's colonizers have always done. All of these also mean that like them, China continues to trap Africa through debt. Unfortunately, African politicians are so irresponsible. It is staggering. For example, in one of the loan contracts between China and Nigeria, there is a clause waiving Nigeria's sovereignty. When challenged, the minister in charge of the negotiation, who actually has aspirations to rule the country, glibly explained that the sovereign guarantee is simply in the agreement to assure that the loan will be paid back to China. But it does not take rocket science to know that the situation that Sri Lanka currently finds itself in is due to the fact that it owes so much and that international sovereign bonds constitute a major portion of the country's foreign debt. China, along with Japan and the World Bank, are Sri Lanka's biggest creditors. Sri Lanka's currency is collapsing causing severe shortages of food, fuel, electricity, and medicine. So China's investment in Africa go beyond physical structures. It has been actively investing in propagating the Mandarin language and its culture in Africa. There are now Chinatowns in many African countries and China has established over 50 Confucius institutions across 33 countries. Zimbabwe actually accepts Chinese currency for transactions. Even more worrying is the fact that in 2017, China built its first overseas base in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa thereby connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean through the Suez Canal. That base has a capacity to accommodate 10,000 Chinese troops. I'm pretty sure that not much of what I'm sharing here is news because the U.S. and its uh, Western allies are all busy shouting from the rooftop that China is exploiting Africa. The real reason, however, behind their concern is the fact that China is giving them a run for their money on the continent. It's not as if they, would, they have ever done anything different from what China is doing. The United States is currently Africa's largest investor with thousands of American companies operating all over the continent. Already, the U.S. has over 7,000 troops spread across um, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Democratic Republic of, um, of Congo, Kenya, Libya, Mali, 
Mauritania, Southern Sudan, Somalia, and Tunisia. The U.S. is also working to increase the number of their troops in Africa. For example, they have offered to set up a base in Nigeria, and I'm sure they're doing it in several other places. Ostensibly, they claim their troops are in Africa to help combat terrorism, but we all know the result of that. In reality, the U.S. is simply starkly aware of Africa's potential as the continent of the future, and it is bent on competing with China for power and influence there. I really don't want to leave this episode on such a negative note. Africa has some strengths which our politicians need to wake up to. First, the education and provision of employment opportunities for our youth must be foremost in all that we do. Ideally, we should be working more cohesively together in a pan-African organization across and beyond the continent. However, even if we are unable to always count on North Africa in a bid to stop this move to continually keep us colonized uh, for reasons too complex to go into here. There are 46 sub-Saharan African countries and there is strength in that number. Besides, we have a huge widespread diaspora spread all over North America, particularly the US, also in South America, the Caribbean and Europe that we should be working with. Israel would not be such a major country to reckon with today without its diaspora. One of the advantages to be gained by this kind of agenda, uh, Pan-African agenda, is also illustrated by Israel and Jews in diaspora. The establishment of a solid state of Israel benefited from the Jewish diaspora as much as the Jewish diaspora benefited from the establishment of the state of Israel after the Second World War and the strength that that state has garnered since then. While anti-Semitism is not completely dead, Jews all over the world are more better respected than they were ever before. You will note that I have not mentioned that we should strengthen the AU, the African Union. This is because the only way that the African Union can truly work to get Africa to where it needs to be is for it to be fully funded by African countries. To quote uh, the poet Audre Lorde, the master's tool will never dismantle the master's house. We need to fashion and be in control of our own tools. Thanks for watching. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe if you have not yet done so and please turn on your notification buttons so you know when we have new episodes. And of course, share our videos with all your contacts.